This is Brian Kempel of Continuum Philosophical Insight, and today we're going to take 15 minutes to talk about literature and philosophy. If you want to know more about me, who I am, and the work I do, there are some important links below. Now, today I'm starting a new series of 15-minute insights devoted to the topic of literature and philosophy. I'm not yet sure how many videos there will be, as I'm exploring several ideas I've had, but only sketch them out very roughly. I can, can say that there will be at least three related videos for three related ideas, including the one today. But the first among these ideas, and the focus of today's 15-minute insight, is the concept of literature itself. That is, what do we really mean by the word literature? What comes to mind, for me at least, and I would assume for many others, are the classics as presented in print books. The things we read in those college courses called literature. Dickens and Tolstoy and the Bronte sisters and Dostoevsky and Dante and Evelyn Waugh and so on and so forth. Especially if uh, you picture them with fine leather bindings and gold leaf edges. But while this might be what we mean by literature in the proper sense, the term is easily extended. For literature is the most deeply ingrained medium of storytelling in the history of Western civilization. It goes all the way back to the writing down of Homer's epics of the Iliad and the Odyssey, and is still something continued on today. However, in recent decades, of course, television and film have displaced the written word as the most common medium, or most common media, for story-seeking audiences. Nevertheless, I think literature retains its place as sort of the, the archetype or the principle of our storytelling approach uh, so deeply that the story-constructing aspects of our moving pictures retains an inherent connection to the literary. Uh, not only in that Hollywood steals many of its ideas from books, but in that the foundational notions of both television and film, by and large, are the same as they are in writing a book. Um, it's not to say that screenwriting and book writing or novel writing are the same thing or can be done in exactly the same way, but they rely on the same principles which have been established in novel writing or literary writing uh, for quite a long time. So to get at the roots of literature is in a way to get at the roots of all our storytelling. Uh, that there are profound differences in the various storytelling media, that is, differences between how we read a story and how we watch or listen to a story. This does not efface the equally profound similarities in their constitutions. In a later video, I will examine the differences and commonalities explicitly, but today I want to look instead at the roots of storytelling and why they are important for us as human beings. Which is to say, what is the personal importance of these storytelling roots and these storytelling medium? Now, oftentimes when I think of literature and its effect on me personally, I think of Graham Greene's short novel, The End of the Affair. Uh, I've read many of Graham Greene's works, um, and they're, they're all very interesting, and uh, I'm not sure that I would say The End of the Affair is the best of them. In fact, really, if it comes down to the sheer force of a story, I probably like uh, The Power and the Glory better. But The End of the Affair is one which has stuck with me in a rather personal way. Um, <clears throat> it's a book I highly recommend, and it's one which has twice been adapted by Hollywood, though both times I would say as a failure. And it's a story that focuses around a single theme, namely the tight connection between love, jealousy, and hate. So to give the briefest spoiler-free synopsis, the protagonist, Maurice Bendrix, who is himself a novelist in the story, and therefore is understood to be a sort of standing in the place of Graham Greene himself, has an affair with the wife of a neighbor named Sarah Miles. Uh, Sarah's husband is a bureaucratic functionary in the government, and he's a rather dull, uninteresting person. Kind, but a bit obtuse. Uh, one day, Sarah breaks off the affair, kind of quietly and with no explanation, and for no reason that Bendrix can fathom. And he becomes consumed with jealousy and even a kind of hate for Sarah. Uh, the story itself begins after the affair has ended, and is written through 
partial recollection of their trysts and certain present-day pursuits. Bendrix becomes convinced that she has moved on to another lover, and finds his inability to possess her to be a cause for hating her, and for hating the unknown lover, no matter how mature he tries to be about it. Uh, even while the affair is going on, he has a certain sort of jealous hatred in a very minor way for for Sarah's husband, uh, because he in some way possesses her that uh, Bendrix doesn't, but he's more concerned with the sexual aspect of things. I mean, after all, if she were married to one man but sleeping with another, that other man can't really be surprised if she is sexually unfaithful to him, too, uh, you know, can he? And yet, as Bendrix demonstrates, despite there being no justification for surprise, that man can nevertheless be uh, quite jealous and quite angry. Now, this core theme of the book, the tight connection between love, jealousy, and hate, is one on which I could speak at pretty great length from a philosophical perspective. I could talk about the different ways in which we love some object, uh, object being said in the sense of a previous 15-minute insight, or why we find an object lovable, or how love is not merely a feeling had by an individual, but rather a complex pattern of relations. And because of that, one small twist in that pattern may end up disrupting the whole. Or I could talk about how jealousy stems from the belief that one deserves or is in the right in desiring some object which has been turned away from oneself, especially because it has been taken by another, because that is the possibility of possession has been denied. And I can talk about how quickly that kind of jealousy turns into hatred. For we experience hatred or hate as a relation of anger at whatever we believe has prevented us from possessing the object that we desire. But these detached abstract considerations and analyses, while possibly helpful and informative, and while they may deepen our understanding of our own emotions and struggles and so on, are much like reading about wine. Which is to say that you don't really understand wine or how it affects you until you drink it. Uh, no matter how much you have theoretically imbibed the knowledge about wine's effects on the human body, uh, until you put alcohol in your body, drink it, consume it, and in a sufficient quantity, you really don't know what it is that it's going to do. And so can we really understand love, lust, jealousy, and hatred unless we experience them? And how much of a trope is it in, in all sorts of storytelling to have a character say that they thought they understood what love was, but didn't really until they were in a relationship with so-and-so, right? Um, well, I think the same thing is true of jealousy and, and probably even hatred. Uh, lust is in some sense probably the most common of those and the one that uh, everyone experiences sooner or later and most likely sometime in puberty. But anyway, I don't think we can understand these emotions, these experiences, unless we've experienced them ourselves. Though that is not to say that merely experiencing them will necessarily make us understand them either. Now, jealousy in particular among these emotions central to the end of the affair, seems to me the most easily misunderstood. And for one thing, it is, because it's very related to it and very alike to it, often confused with envy, which is specifically the desire for what another person possesses because of how that possession evidently elevates the person possessing it. In other words, we envy our neighbor's good looks, nice car, better house, more attractive spouse, and so on. Envy is really, at its root, impersonal. It doesn't matter who the neighbor is, if we like or hate the neighbor, we want their attributes for ourselves because we believe that those attributes grant that neighbor a higher standing than ourselves, that they somehow make the neighbor better than we are. Jealousy, on the other hand, is always personal, and is always moreover directed at interpersonal relations, either their presence or their absence, and quite frequently both. Think of any man jealous that a woman is with another man, 
and I expect that most men have at some point or another experienced something like this. That he is jealous that the relation he wants with the woman for himself is had by another. We may be jealous that the woman we love loves another, or we may be jealous that the woman we love has sex with another. Love, as I said, is a complex pattern of relations, and to see the object of our love related to something or someone else in a way we believe integral to the pattern of experiencing love results in the arousal of jealousy. And it hurts. I mean, jealousy is painful. And that pain, unless you have experienced it yourself, is indescribable. It does not matter if one describes it philosophically or in a literary format, no description is adequate to the experience. Yet, despite the inevitable inadequacy, I think that literature does help us to know and perhaps recognize the pain of jealousy as it is experienced, and indeed the experience of any emotion, much more than philosophy does. I mean, if you have experienced jealousy, that is, you will recognize it much better in Grand Greene's writing than you will in any philosophical description of it I may give, even if my philosophical description is helpful for distinguishing what is or is not jealousy. Uh, it cannot give an example as well as Graham Greene's End of the Affair. And therefore, I would say that the book does a remarkable job of shedding light on the experience of jealousy, the hurt, the anger, the suspicion, the confusion, and even the hatred that follow from wishing another's interpersonal relation would be our own. And ultimately, in the end of the book, um, this is, you know, again, avoiding any spoiler, it shows us also the typical small-mindedness of the jealous person. That most frequently our jealousy is somehow or another misdirected because we have not been loving the object of our, of our emotions, of our feelings in the proper way, or because we have misunderstood our own relation to that object, or how we should be disposed to the object. This function, showing us more clearly through the written word what we experience in ourselves and in the world at large, is what historically has been called mimesis. That is, the imitation or representation of what is found in nature. And human relations are absolutely something found in nature. Uh, they're a particular branch of nature, a cultural branch, um, and entail all sorts of things which are purely natural as well. Uh, but that's another issue altogether. That this is a purpose of poetry or literature, that is, to exercise the mimetic function, was a theory laid out by Aristotle uh, in his Poetics, and it's um, an interesting text to look through and go through in its own right. But at the same time, we have to question how. You know, how does a story not only represent something found in natural reality, or perhaps even through some sort of unnatural portrayal of things as real in science fiction, but how does the story show that something more clearly than when seen in itself? Put in Aristotelian terms, mimesis, literary mimesis, exhibits the formal realities of things, not in abstraction, but in their dynamic interaction of action and passion, of continual material alteration and contingency. So green shows us jealousy not just as defined, or as we might understand it generally and abstractly, but as viscerally actual in personal experience, at least as well as any one individual might relate something deeply personal and idiosyncratically experienced to another person. But this presentation of the form of jealousy in the matter of dynamic action between characters is not all that is accomplished by the good nomadic story. For any given dynamism between form and matter, and that is the changes and possibilities of changes which we observe, is part of a pattern of relations, and that pattern too is important for our mimetic recognition. And consider the really good scene in the really absurd story there's something deficient in the mimesis of that story. There might be a great moment, a great dialogue, a great monologue, 
But if the story as a whole is not well patterned, then there is something that fails in its presentation of reality. <clears throat> so moreover, there is or must be a relation between that pattern in which these forms and matter are presented and the audience which perceives and attempts to understand them. The eye sees what eye brings means of seeing, and the uneducated eye will see much less in T.S. Eliot's Wasteland than the educated one, just as the eye which has observed things through a lens of jealousy will better perceive what is portrayed in Green's End of the Affair than someone who has never felt that particular emotion. We bear thereby identify that not only does literature, through its own formal structure, have a mimetic function, such that as the literature is constituted, so it will or will not adequately represent an intelligibility. But literature always involves the thinking of the author and the receptivity of the audience, all of which is to point towards what literature is. That is, we know a thing by knowing its functions, and if we can recognize that these, and perhaps others, are the functions of literature, we can get some idea as to the nature of literature. Now, I deliberately choose the word nature here rather than essence or quiddity, with a specific purpose in mind. For each term, nature, essence, and quiddity, signifies the same thing but with different connotations. And the connotation of nature is that each thing, as it is, has an orientation towards some end, towards some further actuality which fulfills its purpose. And what we can see from literature's function, however briefly we have here looked at it, is that its nature includes being instructive. Instructive, that is, about the human condition as lived, and exemplified in characters and their actions. This is not to say that literature must reinforce a moral code, or that it has to, quote, have a good lesson. Rather, good literature will invariably teach us something without trying to do so, and usually trying to teach us something will not produce good literature. And I think this is uh, something that literature has in common with philosophy, that it instructs not by imposing on us some a priori predetermined structure of truth, but rather it shows to us from experience what is true. And so, by the same token, I think part of the danger of literature, and of all storytelling in general, is that it may be deceitfully persuasive, just as a pursuit of wisdom may turn from a love of it to a claim of its possession, and therefore turns from philosophy to sophistry. So to the mimetic presentation of what is in nature may turn from sh a showing of what is to a showing of what is wished for. Now, how literature and storytelling turns from the former to the latter is what I will try to show over the next two 15-minute insights, starting with the effects of the medium and following that up with the relation between concepts and percepts as influenced by stories. As always, thank you for listening and subscribing, and if you find these videos worth your time, uh, consider whether they might also be worth $3.25 per month, or really any amount, or, you know, essentially the equivalent of an overpriced cup of coffee. And if you think that they are, maybe take a visit to my Patreon page linked in the notes below. Thank you.